and welcome to an IMF panel with the bold title, Money at a Crossroads, Public or Private Digital Money. Now, I'm Gillian Tett, I'm with the Financial Times, and I'm delighted to be moderating this because we really are at a fascinating crossroads in many ways. A geopolitical crossroads for tragic reasons, an economics crossroads, a tech crossroads, but also something of a crypto crossroads. Because cryptocurrency started life initially very much as an anti-establishment movement. Some might say cult, some might say innovation. And for the first few years, it was presumed that crypto was something that was going to threaten central banks and governments. And in many ways, that governments and central banks and others would try to clamp down on. Fast forward to today, and we're seeing some astonishing developments. Um, the ones that have grabbed the attention have been things like the fact that China is now doing pilots of its digital currency, although the pilot involves an eye-poppingly large number of people. We've got a debate in America about whether the Fed will try and test a digital dollar or not. Europe is doing some very interesting things as well. But in many ways, the area of greatest innovation is coming often not from the giants, but from the emerging markets. And we have a great group of people today to talk to us about what is happening in terms of CBDCs and other forms of digital money, the attitudes of the governments and central banks towards it, what the sticking points and risks are, and what the opportunities are as well. We have Kristalina Gyorgyeva, um, who is the IMF Managing Director, Roberto de Oliveira um, Campos Neto, who's the Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, who has been very outspoken in pushing forward this debate in the last couple of years, Ravi Menon, from the Managing Director from the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which has been playing a particularly interesting role in pioneering a number of experiments, not just in terms of digital money inside Singapore, but cross-border CBDCs, which of course another area of great interest. And we also have, we're honored to have for the first time, Minister Sintaraman from the Minister of Finance from India, which is a country which is doing some very interesting experiments as well, which we're going to hear about in just a moment. But perhaps I can start by asking you, Managing Director, um, how do you evaluate, how does the IMF evaluate CBDCs at the moment? Do they regard this as a threat? Um, is it something that's too risky to be developed or is it something of an opportunity? I am very excited to be on this exceptionally strong uh, panel and very much looking forward to hear from the uh, uh, participants who bring hands-on experience on this topic. Uh, at the IMF, we recognize that uh, a saying that we used to uh, deploy, the future is digital, no more applies for the future. The future has arrived and that is also valid for the world of money. What has happened uh, over the last couple of years is really astonishing. We have seen the creativity of private sector bringing a diversity of instruments, some of which are closer to money and some of which are really investment class. Um, crypto assets uh, that are quite volatile hardly can be deployed as money and we actually advise against adopting them as money. But stable coins have more of the potential to serve in the intermediation uh, between uh, savers and uh, those who are interested in investments in this new uh, digital world. And of course, the most interesting development is with central bank digital currencies. Why? Because over the last years, when the pandemic pushed the world to digitalize faster, we have seen tremendous explosion of interest. We run a survey among our membership. Over 100 of our members are at some point of exploring central bank digital currency. At the head of the pack, the Bahamas, the first country to introduce the Bahamas sand dollar, and uh, followed by Nigeria and others. Uh, but at different stages, we find countries big and small. And what we recognize is that 
the world of money is going to do the right thing. And it is to drive innovation that private sector is so good at providing in technology combined with the trust built by the participation of central banks, regulators and standard settlers. And that is moving in a way that hopefully will bring to the uh, economy this cheaper, faster service that digital money can uh, provide without the uh, overwhelming risks we have to be mindful of. And what are these risks? Uh, private uh, digital money can try to do wrong things, support crime or terrorism. They can avoid taxation in a way that affects the public purse. Uh, the produ production of some of them, like uh, you know, to get Bitcoin, means energy being used in massive amounts uh, in some countries already causing deficit of energy supply. And on top of it, we have the big question of standardization and inclusion in a global system for which policymakers have to step uh, forward. All of this being said, we are at the crossroad around how fast, how far, in what proportions but sure, I see this as a one-way street in which digital money are going to play a bigger role. So better roll our sleeves and make sure that they are trustworthy, that the providers are regulated, and there is interoperability across central bank digital currencies. Well, that's quite a laundry list of requests, if you like to put it politely. Um, but one of the reasons why I do find digital money so fascinating is that we are seeing so much innovation coming out of the emerging markets. Um, call it, if you like, reverse innovation, call it leapfrogging. In many ways, most pioneering centers are not those found in the um, developed world. And India is playing a particularly interesting role in this respect. Um, Minister Sitarathan, can you tell us... Um, what exactly India is trying to do with its crypto market? I mean, there are reports that, you know, last year you were one of the fastest growing globally. Um, you had the second highest number of users worldwide, although like everything in crypto, there is debate about the reliability of those statistics. Um, but however you rank globally, there's a lot going on. So what is driving demand in India for crypto and where do you see this going? Well, thank you, Managing Director, to have uh, invited me to participate in this uh, discussion. And thank you, Gillian, for being the anchor. Uh, yes, I'm very happy to talk about uh, India and uh, India's performance uh, in the digital world. We've, uh, as a government, spent a lot of time over the last decade trying to build the digital infrastructure framework uh, within which we had ensured that we have brought in the data security and also data privacy elements and also created what is the India stack, which actually is an indigenously developed uh, technology driven uh, enabler so that innovations which are coming across for creating platforms such as the API platforms, which is open API. Uh, which has enabled us to come up with this uh, universal identity, uh, biometric based, which we call Aadhaar. Subsequently, we've also created a database, I mean, uh, a platform, which is used for the uh, GST, the Goods and Services Tax Network. Similarly, we've also made sure that uh, the uh, bills payment systems and the unified payment interface have all been created under the India stack because there was a common uh, public good which has been uh, brought in into the element of digital innovations that the government funds and develops, which into which many of the private sector have also come into play and they have uh, also joined their forces in making sure that this public good is used for common um, collective uh, good in a way. 
Now, if you look at simultaneously the way in which the startup environment is building up, India has the third largest ecosystem. In fact, uh, if I may put it this way, uh, one in four startups belong to the fintech uh, world and uh, they are now uh, increasingly becoming unicorns also. 20 unicorns belonging to fintech within the last two, three years. And in fact, uh, the adoptability, adoption rate, as they say, if I use 2019 data, the digital adoption rate in India is about 85%, whereas uh, globally that same year, it was only somewhere near 64%. So um, the pandemic time actually helped us to test and prove for ourselves that it is simple to use, common people can use it, and adoption actually was proven, and the data statistics of 2019 got corroborated because common people started using it in a big way. The government also did direct benefit transfer because from 2014, every Indian citizen has been given, in the name of financial inclusion, a bank account. And using the biometric identity that we have uh, used to verify the account so that no ghost uh, claimant can be there, uh, government's benefits which reach common people, very poor people, uh, through the direct benefit transfer, directly went into their accounts, uh, thereby giving a very clear, transparent image that there cannot be any pilferages. So the confidence in the common public also got built. Therefore, the digital infrastructure that we had created over a decade has actually been uh, effectively, be effectively tried and tested during this time. That actually is the trigger for us to have announced in the February 2022 budget that we'll come up with a central bank driven currency, digital currency. So that for an opening remark, this is what is actually uh, driven the whole process. And if I can give you just one more data, nearly 299 million people in the rural areas of India have all now become digitally savvy. And to that number today, we have brought in 135 million more uh, so that uh, the benefits can reach people and everything can be done through their phones mm -hmm. rather than uh, going to the bank. And these phones are not smartphones. Many of them are uh, feature phones which uh, today can benefit from the technological revolution which is going on in the country. Well, I must say I find this fascinating because sitting here in America um, where the stimulus um, support were handing out by old-fashioned checks which got lost in the post and went to people um, you know what happened in India I find fascinating as an example yeah. of you know potential leapfrogging thank you um, one quick question before I turn to Governor Campos Neto which is this you've also another thing you've done which is quite striking is you've introduced a 30% tax on the profit of crypto assets and a 1% tax deducted on transactions can you just tell us briefly what um, triggered that action? Are you concerned that's going to slow the growth of the crypto market down? Um, it was only in this budget, which is February 2022 budget, that we had come up with this 30% uh, tax on income earned out of these transactions. We don't recognize those which are outside of the central bank. The central bank has yet to come up with a digital currency. That was part of my announcement in the budget. Uh, and that uh, will happen sometime in 22, 23, the financial year ending March 23. But in the meanwhile, we have noticed, and of course, as, as you rightly said, we are not sure about the veracity of the data, which says the volume is this much or that much. Uh, those numbers are questionable, but I wouldn't get into uh, arguing about the number at this stage. But uh, we did realize there's a lot of uh, things happening about transacting those assets, the crypto assets, which we don't recognize as currency. Mm -hmm. Because currency is that which is backed by a bank, the central bank of the country or the government of that country. So uh, that is yet to happen in our country and it is going to happen sometime this year. But because the volumes of such transactions outside of this was fairly huge, we also wanted to be sure that and since there was no regulatory mechanism looking at them, we wanted to make sure money is being or value of assets being transacted 
if they are transacted in an unregulated environment, we were not sure if the, let us say, uh, the FATF's uh, money trail, uh, as they say, travel route, travel line, is being uh, tracked at all. And we were not even sure as to um, how we can keep uh, a, a trail following of these transactions which were happening. After all, these were uh, electronic codes eventually. So we wanted to be sure and therefore we did announce that on the income that is generated out of the transactions of these crypto assets will be taxed at 30%. And over and above that, there is a 1% tax deduction at source, which is also imposed on every transaction. So through that, we'll be able to know who's buying and who's selling it. Mm -hmm. And that 1% is not an additional tax over the 30% that I've imposed. It is only reconcilable with the 30 or with any other tax the person uh, is uh, expected to pay. Essentially, by taxing, we were trying to make sure that we are keeping a trail mm -hmm. and also making sure these are going to be eventually uh, compliant with anti-money laundering rules mm -hmm. and making sure that these kind of operations don't end up inadvertently to funding any kind of terror activities. So we wanted to be sure when there was no regulation happening these activities which were becoming now fairly extensive are kept an eye on and there should be a financial implication on them and therefore the tax. It wasn't as if we have uh, legitimized them. We haven't said that this is currency. We haven't said that this has intrinsic value, but certain operations are taxable for the sovereign and that is why we've done this. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think, again, that's another area where other countries are going to be watching very closely, both in terms of the idea of creating a paper trail mm -hmm. to regularize it, but also in terms of finding more revenue or revenue sources, which almost every government wants to do right now. That's but um, mm -hmm. Governor Campos Neto, I'm curious, you know, Brazil has a very, very vibrant um, ecosystem on payments already. We've been in lots of innovation. One of the questions um, I often hear asked is, if you have, not just you, but other countries have all this innovation going on right now with um, non-crypto assets, why does anyone actually need to use crypto at all? I mean, when you look at crypto today, do you see this as simply um, a bolt-on or something that might make the existing non-crypto legacy payment systems more efficient and vibrant in competition with crypto? Or do you think that crypto really has a valuable role to play within the Brazilian ecosystem today? Well, thank you. I, I want to start uh, saying thank you for the MD for the invitation. Thank you, Gillian. Um, I, I think uh, one thing that we know for sure is that uh, we don't know. Uh, I don't know where financial. I, I don't think we know what financial intermediation is going to look for, look like mm -hmm. in three, four years, for sure. So um, I think the real challenge is identifying the tendencies and understanding how can a central bank cope with that. Um, in the case of Brazil, we've had a lot of improvements. We've done a lot of improvements in credit card payments over the years, um, and, and the system grew a lot. Uh, but in 2019, we're starting to see that there's some migration, some tendencies going on, one of which was the merging between texting, payments, and content. So you're looking at the big text trying either to do payment or if you had payment, you're trying to do content. And, and in a way, you're seeing the verticalization of the sales process from having uh, the content, the payment, and the messaging or the texting, understanding what people thought about the product. That was generating a lot of data, and I think we started to see a run for the data. This verticalization in process, in process generated uh, this huge uh, movement of inserting EI into financial intermediation. Um, and then we start moving forward, and we look at the Web3 we look at what the DLTs, the decentralized ledgers are doing. Uh, but then I think we are now in a phase where we look at the protocols, uh, which are really the instruments. And when we look at some of these protocols, we really have done an amazing uh, improvement in terms of being able to generate efficiency, composability, suitability. Um, it's really moving very fast. When we talk about crypto assets, 
I think for people focus too much on the assets itself, but the, 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 the beauty of it is the networks that are being created. And the networks that are being created, like I said, with the protocols, and they have a lot of good characteristics that will be used and that will change financial intermediation in the future. It's already, it's already happening in a way. Uh, you have protocols that decrease in costs, the huge decrease in costs from banks. Uh, they are faster, they are auditable, they are transparent. Um, a lot of them can include traceability in things that today you can't. Um, and then at the end, your lower cost, increase transparency and you generate financial inclusion. So I think the real question is, um, you know, rather than what do you need crypto is, you know, how can we regulate this? You know, what, what should the central bank do? And, 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 and I think when we look at uh, what needs to be done, uh, basically uh, the question is how to regulate something that's so nonlinear and so exponential. You need to regulate with a forward looking. You want, you want to make sure that competitive today means competitive tomorrow. But when it's nonlinear, it's much more difficult to do that. So I think uh, you need to ensure an orderly transition. It's going to be hard to do it. There's some disruption that will happen. Uh, the way we're doing in Brazil is first, we understood that we needed a common instant payment system that was the channel for a lot of these things. So we started doing uh, uh, the project, the, the PIX project. Uh, we evolved in the PIX project uh, quite fast. Um, it's now uh, used by a lot of uh, the population. We also are developing the CBDC. We think the CBDC, uh, and we can talk about that later, the CBDC will play a different role. Um, you know, and at the end, I think the cryptos will play a part. Um, I think trying to differentiate cryptos will just generate uh, a movement to migrate to uh, an environment that's going to be more difficult for us to see. Uh, I think that there is a big challenge, big opportunities. Uh, and again, I think whatever you see asymmetric information and you see cost, technology will come and disrupt it. And it's happening. And it's happening in financial intermediation. It's happening in other places too. Um, so I think at the end, I will leave with the fact that I think this is good because it generates financial inclusion. And I think we are seeing a whole democratization of the financial intermediation uh, system. Thank you. Right. Well, I'll kind of come back to the CBDC question in a moment because, of course, that's very widely watched right now by people in the crypto community. Um, but before I do, I'd like to turn to um, Managing Director Menon because, um, as Governor Camponetta said, the question of regulation is key. There are two ways to approach it. You can either let the innovation rip and see what happens and then jump in later on at the end and try and control it, or you can be part of the innovation process. And it seems to me that the MAS in Singapore has tried to be part of the innovation process by teaming up with a range of banks, whether it's JP Morgan or DBS or groups like Ethereum, to try and experiment itself in how crypto is developing. Can you tell us a bit about what the regulatory philosophy is of Singapore and how, what you've learned from these experiments? Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. And first of all, uh, to thank the IMF and uh, Kristalina for the invitation uh, to discuss this very important topic. Um, before I get to the issue you've raised, I want to get back to an issue you raised at the start, Gillian, which I thought uh, uh, put the finger on the, on the number of it, which is uh, the phenomenon itself. Uh, I'd say let's uh, a bit of clarity about what we mean by crypto assets would be key. And I'd say crypto assets or the crypto phenomenon is about digitally representing anything that we regard as having value, putting encryption around it and putting it on a distributed ledger where the ownership of that asset, that digital asset can be ascertained, verified and transfer of ownership can take place uh, in a verifiable way. I think that is the central innovation and phenomenon we need to understand. And cryptocurrencies, about which there is so much excitement, is just one small sliver of the full potential of what the, a crypto asset economy might look like, or a tokenized economy where you tokenize assets. Yes. So I think that is the larger picture, and that is what's uh, exciting for uh, us in the MAS and in Singapore, the possibility and potential to build uh, a tokenized economy. This is probably bigger than the wave of securitization we saw 20, 30 years ago, which allowed 
financial assets to be securitized and denominated and traded. Uh, with the crypto economy, uh, the real benefit is that hitherto uh, unmonetizable assets, say a farmer's cows, a person's ship or a boat, art, all manner of assets or items of value which today can't be monetized can potentially be tokenized, put on a cryptograph and on the distributor ledger. And that is what hugely powerful and revolutionary. So that is the vision. Now, uh, cryptocurrencies are crypto assets which perform a payments function and try to mimic money. And I would argue that private cryptocurrencies, and in, in this I agree totally with uh, uh, my, my three other panelists, that um, it is unlikely to perform the functions of money simply because the value is unstable and it's not backed by the central bank or the government. Then you have the phenomenon of stable coins, with which I think we have uh, at the MAS a greater interest because here you have a cryptocurrency that is pegged to a fiat currency and therefore uh, derives stability. But there are two catches here. One, how is this backing realized? It's not clear to me that all the stable coins out there today in the world, uh, which purport to have a backing, are indeed backed. What kind, what's the quality of that backing? It's not clear. So again, it's hard to imagine how they'll fulfill the function of money. But I think they do need to be taken seriously and stable coins will become a feature in the world as long as their backing is strong. In fact, I think stable coins could well challenge the uh, currencies of many smaller or emerging market economies uh, because if they're widespread usage, they could actually lead to currency substitution and with that, potential loss of monetary sovereignty uh, among these countries. So stable coins are some, is a piece I would watch very closely. Then on CBDCs, as you said, uh, in the MAS, we make a very careful distinction between wholesale CBDCs and retail CBDCs. Both are digital currencies issued by the central bank. Wholesale CBDCs, we see a variety of use cases because they're used in the interbank system to effect a cross-border payment. Today, that is in a dreadful situation. <laughs> Sending money to you, Gillian, in the UK, uh, is long, laborious, costly, inefficient, and insecure. Um, and, you know, you won't get what I actually intend to send to you. So that's a problem we need to solve. And wholesale CBDCs address that because in a domestic payment system, you have a central bank that acts as a central counterparty. In a cross-border setting, you don't have that. And so you do need a decentralized ledger or a blockchain. And you need wholesale CBDCs to facilitate that transfer. Uh, retail CBDCs, about which there's now a great deal of excitement, I'm not entirely sure, and, and the MAS is keeping an open mind on it. All of our experiments with the industry have been on wholesale CBDCs. We've launched a project to say, if necessary, we should be able to launch a retail CBDC to make sure we have the technology to do that and the governance and policy structures. But I'm not sure there's a compelling case for it. What does a retail CBDC do uh, that today's digital payment system cannot do? And we've heard from Minister Sitaraman about what India has done, what many, about 20 or 30 other countries have done, including the United Kingdom. A faster pay system where retail payments can be made 24 seven in real time, bank account to bank account at zero cost. In Singapore, you can do it three clicks on your mobile phone and I can send money to a friend. Um, so when you can do that, what does a retail CBDC bring? Because all the advantages of digital cash is embedded in that. Mm -hmm. So I think the regulatory approach you have taken uh, distinguishes the different types of crypto tokens. If a crypto token is being offered as a security uh, with an expectation of a reward, then it's regulated under the Securities and Futures Act. And in extreme, you have to issue a prospectus. <laughs> And that, of course, kills off these, these issuers. Uh, but that's what it means. Because if you're telling an investor that you're having a right to a return that is being generated by this activity for which this token is a representation, then you ought to treat it like a security and have full disclosure 
and investor protection requirements. Now, if mm -hmm. the digital token is being offered as a payment instrument, then it comes under the Payment Services Act, where the focus is on anti-money laundering and on technology risk management and increasingly investor protection, uh, uh, customer protection, meaning the funds are secured. So I think we need to look at the underlying activity and nature and quality of the crypto asset, determine the specific risks they pose and right size regulation to address those risks. And if you right size regulation on an activity based uh, approach, you do not overdo things, but at the same time, you hold them to the same high standards. So for a payment service provider, it's held to the same high anti-money laundering standards that we hold banks to. But we don't regulate them like banks because they don't do all the rest of the stuff that banks do. So on the other things, they have a lighter regime. So that facilitates innovation, gives them more latitude and space. And yet for the risks that they pose, we hold them to the same high standard. Right. Well, I think it's fascinating what you point out about the difference between wholesale and retail CBDCs. And, you know, I sometimes think that in the world of retail CBDCs, the main benefit of CBDCs has been to put um, the fear of God into the legacy payment systems and force them to rapidly innovate and upgrade to fend off the competition. But I'm curious, I mean, do you think there's a danger that public sector CBDCs will end up crowding out private innovation or private alternatives, either in terms of cross-border CBDCs, where there does seem to be a real need um, that the CBDCs can actually answer, or even in the retail space. Um, perhaps, Ravi, you could answer that in terms of Singapore, and then I want to ask that to some of the other panelists. Yeah, so the competition between public money and private money, right? Um, history has shown public money has always won. Uh, pu private money tends to be degraded over time, debased. Uh, not that public money also doesn't do that, uh, but I think with modern institutions like central banks and so on, there is a commitment by governments to protect the value of public money in the public interest. But that's a broad philosophical point. Now, if you take retail CBDCs against the competition, I'm not entirely convinced that a retail CBDC is required to meet the competition posed by, say, privately issued stable coins. Um, because what is the advantage? The advantage that privately issued stable coins bring is not that they are digital. All our money today is digital. We make transfers very, very quickly. It is the platform upon which these currencies operate. A stable coin operates on a larger e-commerce or social media platform where the payments function is integrated into a whole range of other things that we do. We want to watch a movie, we want to buy a house, we want to go to a restaurant. Payments is in part of it. We don't desire payments for its own sake. Um, so when you're up against platform economics, I'm not sure retail CBDCs, simply issuing it and putting it on our e-wallet is going to be a... Because you can just as well do that today with your credit cards. So I'm not convinced about retail CBDCs in that regard. Now, wholesale CBDCs, different matter. I think they can do better than uh, private cryptocurrencies or stable coins because of the fiat backing and because they're issued on both sides. So the experiment we did with the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England, uh, both central banks on either side issue a wholesale CBDC, a transfer can be made. I can send money to can a friend in Canada in Singapore dollars, it gets translated into Canadian dollars. Settlement is, you know, uh, just a couple of hours. I mean, that's in the pilot. We've not scaled it yet, but that's the vision. And the wholesale CBDC there acts as an anchor for that blockchain transaction to work. Uh, I would not rule out a privately issued bank CBDC being able to perform the same function, but they don't have any particular advantage because here we are not in the platform situation, we are simply in a cross-border uh, transfer situation. So I think that is going to be a very interesting development to watch over time. And I do think most mm -hmm. of the excitement, most of the impactful use cases are going to be in wholesale CBDCs for cross-border payments, cross-border trade finance, and so on. Well, that's fascinating. I'm going to come back and ask Melissa Sitaratnam in just a moment um, how she sees that playing out in India. Before I do, though, I'd like to ask Governor Campos Neto about Brazil, because Brazil's a country where you have a lot of capital 
moving in and out of the country, sometimes in destabilizing ways. Um, it's a country where obviously the dollar had played or cast a very heavy shadow over the domestic market. I'm curious, how do you see the role of cross-border CBDCs, wholesale CBDCs, and do you see the crowding out risk as well? No, I think it's a, it's a very um, good question. I think Ravi mentioned, um, and uh, I think uh, when he meant uh, wholesale, I think uh, the main benefit that, at least as I understood, is cross-border payments. So here we're talking about cross-border payments. Um, like, like you said in the beginning, not long a time, not not a long time ago, if you ask me what was the fastest way to transfer one million dollars from Brazil to England, people would probably stay on a plane, and then that was actually the correct answer from the plane. So I think it, I think it, it, it tells us uh, uh, the the amount of innovation that we need. Um, I think when we look at uh, uh, what is needed to have this cross-border solution and then actually what people see and what is, uh, what is driving the demand for um, crypto, I think they're one and the same. I think what people need is something that has five characteristics. That is fast, that is cheap, that is secure, that is transparent, and that is open. So I think those are the characteristics that people are looking at. Now, when I look at what we have done in terms of cross-border payments globally, I, I worry a lot because um, the wholesale uh, system, uh, which benefits, which we would be uh, would, would be uh, benefited and would benefit a lot across border payments, only works if it's very interoperable and if it's fast and secure in an interoperable way. And when you look at today, the main experiments that are being done in different places. You don't have the same choice of technology. So some places, for example, are doing centralized. Some others are doing DLT. The way people look at gates are different. The protocols are different. The security, the encryption is different. So I think coordination is key because if you have to have a cross-border payments between a system that is centralized and a DLT, it will not be better than the normal crypto system that exists today. So I think uh, the coordination is very important if we want to make this work. Um, I think that the rapid revolution in payments did not translate into a better cross-border payments. I think we are a bit uh, like behind on that. Um, in the case of Brazil, we completely changed the FX system because we needed to do that before. Most of our laws, FX laws, dated back to 1940s. Uh, we are moving into uh, more of a conversibility FX, uh, and we are connecting instant payment to different platforms, like, for example, the project Nexus. Nexus. Um, so I, I think uh, at the end, I think this, the CBDC could be the ideal ecosystem in this uh, new landscape. Um, I, I do think that uh, we are moving into this uh, new system uh, in which uh, we need to find a solution for cross-border. Um, and the solution will be found by the private sector if we don't have anything better in a year or two. And it's already happening. Even, even though, even though uh, I completely agree that uh, the the cryptos uh, don't have the characteristics that that uh, uh, that, that are, are are welcoming, a welcome for uh, for money, I think we are moving in that in that way. So I think choice of technology, the use of smart contracts. Um, I think uh, uh, we need more coordination, and I think to end, uh, uh, we need to find uh, um, again a solution today, kind of forward looking trying to see what's going to happen in a year or two, because you know those things are accelerating very, very rapidly. And for example, I look at protocols from two years ago, and today uh, you have much better systems. And, but I agree with uh, most of what was said, and I think the biggest challenge for us is cross-border payments. Hello? Yes. So sorry, sorry I just apologize. Sorry. Um, that's part of the nature of the hybrid world we live in, um, in every sense. Um, but uh, it's a great moment to bring in um, Minister Sitaraman because, um, you know, much of the debate and attention in India has been on the um, domestic aspect of payments. How does India see the international component of this? And are you concerned? at all about some of the potential risks of money flooding in or flooding out? Um, yes and no. 
Yes, for one reason, uh, that uh, whether it is the digital, central bank driven digi digital uh, currency or whether it is the assets that we are talking about, which is uh, in the non-governmental uh, domain, the risk which worries me more on the uh, non-governmental domain is essentially you are looking at unhosted wallets through which across the borders, across the globe, this entire operation takes place. So, regulating cannot be done by a single country within its terrain through some effective method and for doing it across the borders, technology does not have a solution which will be acceptable to various sovereigns at the same time applicable within each of the territory. Uh, again, the risks involved on which of course, uh, Ravi Menon elaborated will have to be differentially approached because for each user case, the risks can also be different depending on the economy that you are talking about. There are seven countries, nine countries if I understand correct, uh, some of which uh, Kristen Lena named Bahamas, seven of the Eastern uh, Caribbean countries, mm -hmm. Nigeria. So, if you were to take a case study in a case use in uh, Nigeria, its application and the risks involved will be very different from the risks in uh, let us say a tourism or, or investment rich Bahamas or you know any other country for that matter. So, as long as the non-governmental activity of the crypto assets are through the uh, unhosted wallets, regulation is going to be very difficult. But cross-border payments will become very effective, yes, if through the central bank uh, driven currencies and even then uh, efficiency, transparency and also better management of uh, uh, you know large uh, uh, payments which are being done between countries, all that is taken care of. But even then I would think we have now come to a stage. I agree with the uh, central bank chief of uh, Brazil that two years ago the kind of uh, protocols which prevailed are very different from what it is today, today is being much better. But even with all this said, unless there is going to be a global approach at regulating and also an understanding of the technology even as it keeps evolving to be on the top of things and to have technology driven solutions to regulate and monitor, not so much to interfere, but of course to keep an eye that your anti-money laundering. I harp on that very much because I think the biggest risk for all countries across the board will be on the money laundering aspect and also on the aspect of currency being used for financing terror. So, it is in these two. Otherwise, I do not see a reason why innovation such as this in fin fintech um, uh, whose fountainhead or whose source itself is to bypass many of the regulatory. Innovation is always disruptive. I do not look at it as negative feature. It is a right feature, innovation is disruptive. But on an essential thing of asset or valuation, which might be monetized for funding other activities which are not so savory, I think regulation using technology is the only answer. But regulation using technology will have to be so adept and so nimble that it has to not be behind the curve, but be sure that it is on the top of it. And that is not possible if any one country thinks that it can handle it. It has to be across the board and I am sure Kristalina really is on it already. Well, we are almost out of time, but Kristalina, um, would you like to say any last comments on what the IMF is trying to do to actually ensure there is a kind of collaboration which as Minister Sitharaman you just pointed out, it's so badly needed. Is there anything that the IMS can be announcing soon in this respect? Uh, we have uh, gone to our board of directors um, last year and we said this world of digital money is changing so rapidly that unless we integrate the innovation in regulatory uh, 
learning, not even doing per se, uh, we are going to be in trouble. So we are expanding significantly our work on digital money and we are concentrating on three big questions. Number one, interoperability. How can central bank digital currencies communicate with each other? How can we avoid fragmentation that makes in one particular block cheap, accessible, fast, but not across uh, undermining trade and uh, economic uh, cooperation? Very serious question, very important to solve. Two, regulation. What does it mean to regulate privately issued stable coins and uh, how can regulation be agile and adaptable we need to recognize that disruptive is good but destructive is bad so we have to be able to follow digital money to prevent destructive activities and that means know the wallets and have some standards around the functioning of these wallets. And number three, we haven't talked about it, very significant risk from cyber attacks. How do we strengthen our capacity to deal with these risks? Also for small countries, danger that they would lose monetary sovereignty because other countries' central bank digital currencies will take over. How do we protect against these risks? So we have our work cut out for us and this week I guarantee you there would be a lot of discussion on this topic and I want to just wholeheartedly thank for the uh, incredibly insightful uh, stories we heard today from India, from Brazil, from Singapore. Well thank you very much indeed and as I said at the start it is very good indeed to be hearing about the amount of innovation that is occurring um, in the emerging markets, in many ways, pioneering ideas and leapfrogging other centers as this whole development gathers pace. So I guess if I was to sum up what the managing director just said, watch this space. It's a very fast moving area. And it just remains for me to say thank you very much indeed to all the panelists for their very interesting perspectives and best of luck in figuring it out. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very substantive, <laughs> very interesting. Thank you, everybody. That was really fascinating. Really appreciate it. And lots of food of thought for um, future columns and things. I really appreciate, you know, hearing all your perspectives. <laughs>